Did it work? Ah, oh my God. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. We're live, we're live, we're back together. Hi, everyone, we are live again. How are you? Um, it's a new date, it's a new time, um, but we are still so excited uh, to be together for our Teaching Tuesday. Oh, or as we're calling it, our Mapping Monday. Oh, just a little teaser about what we're gonna talk about. Um, hello, hi. Oh, I've missed you all so much. We're just gonna take a minute. Let's do our virtual check-in. We're, we're getting our viewers, people are coming on. Type in the chat, where are you? Welcome back, everyone. Tell us where you're viewing from. How are you? It's been over a month. Oh, it's been so long. Is everything going okay? School finished, right? We're, we're enjoying our summer vacations a little bit. Um, we got Paul back from Farmington, Missouri. Welcome, Paul. Oh, oh my gosh, we got, all right. I'm gonna put some of these up. Vincent, hi, from Michigan. We got Tony Moon from Michigan. Oops, wait, Vincent's from Los Angeles. Tony's from Michigan. I'm so excited. I'm speaking too fast. Um, Oh my gosh, welcome everyone. I We're on a new day. So we got our Teaching Tuesday friends, right? Like we got our Teaching Tuesday friends. Jenna, hi, how are you? Um, but then we're on a no, new day. Do we have any new first time watchers here um, for, our, for our, our show? Um, keep filling in, keep telling us it's 127 degrees here in Virginia, and I've never been more excited to put on a sweater. I don't know if I can tell you guys how excited I was to get my teaching sweater out of the closet so that we could talk to our buddies like James Riley from Indiana, and we got, wait, I thought I clicked it. Ah, you guys, all these things are coming so fast. All right, so we got people. So, oh my gosh, hold on. Claiborne, welcome. Look, we're officially going international again. Oh gosh, this is awesome. Um, we are exploding here on Facebook, on Twitter. Um, now, now that we've done our roll call, let's talk about, do we have teachers? Do we have any students with us? Museum professionals, just lifelong lovers of history. Um, who do we got? Because while you guys fill that in on, on who you are and, and oh, why you're here, um, I'm gonna fill you in on the day because it is going to be so exciting because it's been over a month since we've been back together. So what we have been doing is been planning this mega session, um, bringing back our primary sources, bringing back um, some incredible thinking routines and all focusing it around maps. I mean, who's excited about maps? I need some some hands here. Look at this. We got we have history museums. We have history buffs. I just saw we have some teachers in here. Um, where did it go? Here. We got teachers. Oh, we got everybody. We're gonna have some great conversations today. And one of the great things about why we're doing this on a mapping Monday, um, do you know what today is the anniversary of? Like, come ready to have your mind blown. Um, today is the anniversary of Washington becoming the surveyor for Culpeper County. Like, what does a surveyor make? Maps. Right. And now we're going to have our mapping Monday where we talk about different things. So I'm sorry if you're getting too much energy right now, but I just like Pat Brown says, love maps, just love them. And so excited to be talking with them. And I'm not going to be talking to you guys alone at this. I mean, I'd love to because we've been apart for so long, but I'm calling in one of the fan favorites that works with us here at T, uh, on our Teaching Tuesdays. Um, you guys know him, you love him. He makes appearances on Teaching Tuesdays. He makes appearances on Book Talk Tuesdays. 
Um, he makes appearances, and by appearances, I mean runs our podcast. You know, he's the voice of Mount Vernon. He's the face of Mount Vernon. I'm going to give him a call, um, and it's Jim Ambusky. Okay, so I'm going to give him a call, see uh, what we got here, if he's uh, going to be available um, and excited to come. Talk as it's ringing. Uh, he's coming here. Huh? Jim? Hi, hey, Jim, can you hear me? I can. Oh, great. Hey, did I catch you on vacation? Well, you know, we usually do these things on Tuesdays, and so I had my Monday shirt on, but here we are. Ah, I'm loving that Monday shirt. I mean, if you can hear me, it's, it's looking good. Um, well, thank you. Yeah, and welcome to, I don't even know if I should be like, welcome to Mapping Monday, welcome to Teaching Tuesday. I mean, what are we, What? it's, it's just like a conglomerate of it all. I think we, we just embrace the best of both worlds and we we call it Mapping Monday on a Tuesday, Tuesday teaching special, I think, you know? Whoa, that is going to be, let's say that two times fast. I can't. I already <laughs> forgot what it was. <laughs> Um, but Jim, we got a really big audience today and we got a lot of, we got viewers here, um, that are with us for the first time. Cause it's mm -hmm. a brand new day. We got, um, people, we got our friends that have been with us through teaching Tuesday from the beginning. I don't know if you know this, but we're going international. Did you see that? We got callers from all over. Um, and they're just as excited to talk about maps as we are. Well, I'm, uh, I'm glad to see everybody. And, you know, I've seen some old uh, friends here that I've, I've, I've seen on, uh, you know, our, our evening live streams for our book talks on, you know, Book Talk Tuesday. And uh, actually several folks who've sent me some very kind emails uh, as of late. So I'm glad to see old friends and new and uh, certainly folks from around the United States, North America and internationally, which is great because we're going to talk about maps and we're going to talk about maps in the 18th century. So there's a lot, uh, a lot to talk about. Uh, and that I think folks will be interested in. Absolutely, because we, yeah, we're going international in the maps we're looking at. I mean, we're we're yeah. we're looking at so we're we're crossing the Atlantic um, with these and looking at other places. So um, while we have our viewers here, um, teachers, I because I saw this great comment uh, from Michael here that he teaches Colonial New Spain and uses maps Ooh. all the time. Um, and I'd love to hear our teachers chime in. How many of you guys also use maps with your students? Um, because everyone knows here, and if they don't, I'm still going to tell you all about it. We love primary sources, right? Like at Mount Vernon, all over, at the library where Jim works, in education where I work. We love primary sources um, because, uh, you know, they help us uh and help with students make those mm -hmm. connections, right, to the past, those emotional connections that, you know, maybe textbooks and secondary sources can't. They really give those feelings. Um, they teach us critical thinking skills, close reading, um, you know, collaboration. I mean, it's it's incredible what, um, you know, inquiry-based skills that primary sources can. Um, and maps are just a great other form because I know Jim works in the library, but even you got to agree, primary sources aren't just documents. Well, I know I completely agree, and I and I would love to hear what maps folks teach in the classroom, or what maps they enjoy, uh, or what maps they work with in their own professions. You know, I think it, you said that uh, maps are really cool primary sources, and you're absolutely right. I mean, it's too it's easy enough to think about maps as something we need to help us find where we're going, but as I think we'll talk about today, you know, maps are really uh, really have a lot to tell us about what people in George Washington's era thought about themselves, what they imagined the world around them looked like, uh, and what they imagined or what they wanted the world around them to look like. Um, there's a whole lot more to maps than just thinking about roads and where the next Arby's is uh, or where I'm going to get my my strawberry shake here after this is over. It's really about the stories we tell about ourselves and the world around us. Perfect. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I love it. And, um, and I love, I love how you're talking about that maps. They're included in the stories. Like mm -hmm. we, we so much look for at maps today as get from A to B. You can't even see my hands. I'm talking so much from A to B direct lines. Um, but maps really show so much more. And so as we look at these maps and Jim and I are going to start discussing these maps, because I want to touch on something that John Resto said, 
Um, oh, yeah. We're going to use um, one of the critical thinking routines that we love using with students. We actually used it on Teaching Tuesday um, on our very last kind of grand finale, and it's our main side hidden thinking routine. Um, it's one of those great items where we have students um, look at different primary sources and break down the main story that's being told. So what is that central narrative that's coming through um, and discussing that, but then looking through, okay, now once we know that, what's happening on the side? What, what is a side story that isn't necessarily at the main focus, but is still a very important piece of the puzzle that's coming through. And then that third step, let's find the hidden story. Let's find those, those ideas that aren't being presented, but that knowledge that we're also still walking away from, whether it's because it's hidden within the, the source or because it's left out, but we know much, we know because of our other historical studying, what context is supposed to be there and what's missing. Um, so I am super excited uh, that these are the um, routines that we're gonna put and that you connected because there are more stories. It's more than just geographical points that we can learn from maps. And April Watkins, everybody say hi to April. Where, boop, 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 boop. Hi April. One of our Teaching Tuesday presenters this is a great research, like it's a great way, as she's saying, to open up inquiry with students. There's so much to learn from maps. Um, and um, here's another great map that people, that Karen uses within mm -hmm. her classroom. Um, she's also touching on that Fry Jefferson map that, that April was mentioning. Uh, yeah, Tony are, Moon here. So that people are really listing some great maps. I mean, they, they absolutely they are. And Jim, the maps that we're going to be touching on today um, are coming from a brand new collection that we have uh, at Mount Vernon here. And I'd love for you to explain mm -hmm. that as I kind of share my screen um, and show uh, our audience where they can find these pieces. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to. Last year, we were very, very lucky to receive a gift from uh, Richard Brown and Mary Jo Otsia. Uh, a, of, a, of a collection of maps <clears throat> numbering uh, over a thousand that feature maps from the uh, really the, the mid 18th century. So the 1750s through the American Revolution and into the early years of the Republic. And so this is called the Richard H. Brown Revolutionary War Map Collection. Um, our friends at the Leventhal Center at the Boston Public Library uh, up in Massachusetts, and I see John Resto uh, uh, mentioned them there. They digitized those maps many years ago, so we have we have high resolution images of many many maps that were used by individuals like George Washington, uh, like uh, uh, British officials in London, uh, or, or were created during the American Revolution itself to chart the course of battles or to plan for battles during that war. And we have maps that are that were used to design uh, the new nation uh, and to, to begin to create what the United States might look like in the years after the American Revolution. So not all of the maps that we have uh, have been digitized. Many of these maps are in bound atlases, and we can talk about what those are later if we want to. Uh, but we have a whole heck of a lot of really amazing maps and things that are called views, which we'll also talk about later as well during our exercise, that really give you a visual sense of what early America looked like and what, what the individuals who created these maps thought early America looked like. And that's, so that's an important thing to think about is the distinction between what actually is, you know, they didn't have satellites or GPS, they couldn't see with precision. And so they had to use the tools of their trade to make some of these maps. Then also we can talk about ways that they they, they made maps to reflect their sense of the world and what they wanted that world to be. I love that. And I, I was just, and I just wanted to point out, I'm, I'm, everything that you're talking about, I'm so excited for us to touch on. What we just walked everyone through is that all of these maps are completely available on our website, on, within our special collections for our, our, the National Library. 
um, for the study of George Washington. Uh, it's a very long title, um, but everything is linked just as always on our teaching Tuesday at mountvernon.org slash online learning. That is remember where we end and start every teaching Tuesday is with our um, with our uh, website here, mountvernon.org slash online learning. It links right to the, the Brown collection, which links right to the collection to explore. And so that's what we're going to do today. Um, great, and so Jim. Yes. Without further ado. Um, Let's get into it. You think we should look at some maps? Let's do it. Um, yes. I mean, I think we gotta, we gotta, uh, excited, scintillating audience here that are ready to dive in. Um, and so I'm gonna pull up our very first map here. Boop, 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 boop. Yeah, we have uh, a great one to start too. I'm very excited. I mean, I'm excited about all of them, but this is a, this is a particularly special one. Right. And so, boom. Ah, well, Jim. Ah, yes. that's a really intimidating map. It, it, it can be like it, it, it has got a lot of stuff going on on that map, right? Right. A lot of wonderful things. So maybe should we, we should start by talking about who made it and, and then we can look at some of the features. Yeah, I think that's a great thing to point out because even though, as we mentioned, we're going to be focusing all of our look at these maps today on the, the kind of main side hidden thinking routine that we do, we never want to forget those um, primary source analysis um, that we did all week, where we, we have those three different levels of questioning, right? We, we're not gonna go full into them, um, but we always wanna remember those kind of steps. Mm -hmm. And so we'll start, I mean, I think it's really important, you know, starting out at that first observation stage, let's take a look at all the kind of different areas on this map that can introduce us to what it is, um, like, let's look for titles, let's look for dedications, let's look for information that gives us that idea of what it is to break it down further. Yes, that's that's a great thing to point out. And, and as we're doing that, I'll just say very briefly that this map uh, was created by a man named Lewis Evans. And so we, we call it the, the Evans map. It was created in 1755. It was published as part of a series of geographical essays that Evans wrote. And Evans was a Welshman. Uh, he immigrated from Wales and he was working in Philadelphia in the mid 1750s. And he created this map because this is a period when uh, many uh, English uh, and British officials and American colonists are interested in getting more precise high resolution maps of places like we see here, the middle colonies in the middle British colonies in America. So the question from Karen, what is the date of the map? 1755, let's see, yeah, 1755, so. Oh, and look, we can find that out right just by exploring right into the title page, the title section, it's mm -hmm. not a page, we're not on a website, the title section. So why don't, why don't, let's, why don't we zoom in a little bit there and, we'll, and we can read some of that, that title. It's a very long one. Can you do it in one breath, Jim, for all of us? Uh, probably not. And I would, you know, I would have a hard time pronouncing some of the indigenous names. And so I, I don't want to, uh, do them injustice by saying the words incorrectly. So I'll just start with the title at the top, a general map of the British, Mi sorry, I even screwed that up. You know, <laughs> a general map of the middle. Okay. British we're all British. excited here. We all get nervous when the maps are around. I know. Oh, I, especially in person when you're, when you're really worried about, you know, not ripping them. Um, a, a general map of the middle British colonies in America. Uh, viz Virginia, Maryland, Delaware, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, New York, Connecticut, Rhode Island. And then as you can see here, it also lists the names of various indigenous peoples who are in and around the areas of Lake Erie, Ontario, Lake Champlain, who, who were living in a space then claimed by France in the mid 18th century. Um, and then yes, where it says at the bottom there, wherein is also Shun, the ancient and present seats of the Indian nations by Lewis Evans, 1755. Great, so just looking at that title here, we're kind of getting the main story and a lot of that kind of surface level information as to what this map is gonna be, right? We're getting who it's by, when it was made, and what it's of. Right, so that tells you a lot. Right, it gives you a, a sense of what you might anticipate seeing on this map. 
Uh, and there's a lot of things on this map that, that we can look at. Uh, I mean, Sadie, I, you know, I'll follow your lead wherever you want to go, we can talk about. But um, there's a lot of good information on this map that that tells you what uh, early Americans like Evans knew about uh, early America and the geog geographic space where they lived, but also what they didn't know. I think that's a really great thing to touch on, Jim, because if we're still kind of in this observation phase, mm -hmm. um, if I zoom out a little, you know, the East Coast here of America, where you can see New Jersey, uh, you can see Maryland outlines in Virginia, looks very full. Um, but as we move further west on this map, things start to get a little less chaotic, maybe. Mm -hmm. Is that a, is that a term we can use? Well, I, I think that's that's right. I mean, is you're absolutely right. If you look at uh, New Jersey, if you look at Long Island, you look at the Chesapeake Bay, by that period, early Americans and British officials who were making maps knew quite a lot about the coastlines and where the rivers were and where the mountains were and the major major uh, colonial settlements were and the uh, uh, what remained of the indigenous populations who still lived in proximity uh, to early Americans and early white Americans in this space. But as you go west into the what, what they called then the Ohio country, just south of Lake Erie, uh, things take a different shape. You can see that they're not quite clear on the on the course of the Ohio River. I mean, if you looked at a map of Ohio today, the Ohio River would swing well south of where that is. Um, and so they have imprecise geographic knowledge. And so when Evans is creating this map, he's not he's not simply going out and surveying all this land himself. He's drawing on different maps that other people have done. And he's reading journals of people who have gone west out uh, into the back country to try to figure out how to represent this space visually. So he, this map is also kind of like an encyclopedia in a sense. It is compiling a bunch of information together in one space. I love that. And I love that story. And I think that's maybe, is can we consider as we're looking at this, maybe um, use that as kind of one of our side stories, things that are happening mm -hmm. on the peripheral of, this is a map that is claimed to Evans. This is saying that he he made it, but he's not the one surveying every section of it, right? right. He's he's putting together a larger thing. So there are other surveyors um, and map makers out in the world creating that, and then it comes together. So this is kind of uh, a communal work uh, of other researchers, other professionals. Yeah, in a very real sense. I mean, he could not have done this alone, and not not in this period, certainly. And and most map makers did not. They relied on the work of each other, and then you know, kind of like a pyramid, they built uh, upon successive layers each time, you know, building more knowledge on top of that base foundation until they got something that they were content with. Yeah, and actually, I just put up Cynthia's question, but I just saw Michael's that I do because we're kind of talking on this. Um, he was, and, yeah. And touching on that. So um, Lewis Evans, yes, he was living and working in Philadelphia at this point. Um, but he would have been relying on maps that uh, people had done in the colonies and that had sent back to Britain that he had access to, you know, probably published copies. Uh, he, he might have had access to manuscript maps as well. I will say that this is one of the most, most important, most important maps of mid 18th century America that we have. Uh, not just at the Washington Library, but in general, this is this is a really, really famous critical map that comes out in this period. Um, and why is that? It is, as I was saying earlier, it's part of a long, uh, a, a longer tradition at this point of trying to get more detail on the British and French settlements in North America. Uh, in part because, you know, as George Washington discovers in the same period, or not discovers, but he knew, there was conflicting land claims between the English and the French. Um, and what, what cartographers are trying to do is help their respective governments establish better claims to some of this land, but also to help people who are running the British Empire uh, make better decisions about it. 
you know, so it has multiple purposes. There's multiple tools at work here. And people in this period, uh, I should say, uh, British colonists, uh, American settlers, people back in London, they are obsessed with, with geographic detail. They want to know more about the spaces that they are inhabiting. And so maps help, uh, maps like these help them to do that. And I love that. So I think that like, I mean, as we're kind of talking through, um, you know, I think the main story. So if we're thinking back to our thinking routine and kind of as we're taking this information and breaking it down, the thinking routine is, um, you know, our main story. This is a map that shows the middle colonies. This is a great it's, it's going to show where New Jersey is in relation to Maryland and Virginia um, and water route back and forth um, that connect the different areas, right? Um, mm -hmm. We even have on the side here, distance tables um, from different areas uh, within those middle colonies. So you can see that um, from Albany, it is 146 miles uh, to New York, uh, New York City. So um, so that's great. So that it, so it is that kind of main story, it is giving us, um, you know, the physical footprint of the colonies. Um, I think we touched on a couple great side story, uh, side histories that we're learning from this. Um, and that is that it is the work of multiple people coming together. Evans is putting, you know, the work of different uh, cartographers, different survey workers together. Um, he, he's in America, but he's not physically going to all these spaces. Um, I think boundary lines are a great secondary mm -hmm. source um, for maps. Um, uh, with this, I'm kind of going back to our title here to look it over. Um, but you know, this talks about, this doesn't say anything where it's telling us it is to show divides so that the French know where the British colonial spaces are, um, or the different areas. Um, and so I think that's a great side, uh, story, but if we want to go to our third, what do you think is a great hidden, um, message uh, or thing to learn from this map, whether it's something that is there that's not initially popping out to us or um, is something that's left off this map, maybe boundaries of other individuals or other um, nations that, that are, are not included. Yeah, that's a great question. And I wonder what some of the folks uh, in the audience think too. And actually, I, I just want to point out, I saw uh, uh, my colleague Rick Britton pop up in the comments saying, in part, Evans used the very famous Fry Jefferson map, which is a, a, a map produced in the 1750s, uh, by in part by Thomas Jefferson's father. So this is a, a great example of how Evans was taking something that was already in the works and incorporating that into his own map. That's fantastic. And I do want to pull up this comment, Jim. Um, about since we were talking about how it is, he is using the maps of other people. Yeah. Um, we've mentioned a lot of European surveyors out there. Um, what about this question here about Native American um, mm -hmm. nations or individuals helping with plotting the lands? So that's a really great question, and I will say that I don't know much about that, and so I'm, I'm, I'm hesitant to venture an answer on that because that. That is, uh, is something I don't know a great deal about, and so I, you know, I don't want to uh, misinterpret recent uh, uh, authors or anything like that. So, uh, but what I, what I will say uh, is actually one of the cool things that maybe we can talk about at another time in another stream are indigenous created maps, um, and so we do have a few examples of those. Uh, one is in Oxford that was uh, in England that was created. We believe by Powhatan, uh, you know, the, the paramount chief of the Virginia Indians who John Smith met in this, the early 17th century. We have another one that's called the Catawba map. It's up Charleston from the early 18th century. Those are really fascinating maps to look at about how indigenous peoples thought about the space around them and thought about uh, how they could visualize social relationships between themselves, but also between themselves and white settlers in this period. So uh, we don't have any examples to show today, uh, but what I will say is this Powhatan's mantle map, I uh, the quick side map story. I was in Oxford last January for a conference and I had some time to kill. And I walked into a museum, the, the Ashmolean Museum, 
And there it was. Like I never in a thousand years thought I would ever see something from uh, from the founding of Jamestown from that particular map. But by God, uh, it's just a good example of how you can see a map visually, but uh, uh, on a digitized screen like this, but then seeing it in person, so seeing something of that importance just um, takes your breath away and changes your life. I mean, really, uh, I, I, I think about that every time I see these maps, like I actually got to see a map that I've been teaching for 15 years, but never in a million years thought I'd ever get to see. So quick digression, but we're back. It's a we're little back. bit of a humble brag, but because it's about a primary source and so awesome, I'm going to allow it. I'm going <laughs> to, we're going to leave it in. All right. We're leaving that in, in, in the, the recording here. But the, but the question uh, that Petty asks is a terrific one. And I just don't know the answer to that. Uh, that's, that's the limit of my knowledge there. Well, and can you can you talk about then the Native American representation in this map? Would this would mm -hmm. could we consider that um, part of the hidden stories about you know whether they are or they aren't um, mm -hmm. represented as we discuss this? I mean, I think that can be a great uh, a great component is that we're looking at European maps, but there are other voices to so be let's, shared. Let's zoom in there and look. You know, as again, what we used to call the Ohio country. Um, and you can see the names of several indigenous peoples. You know, by this point, white settlers would have known where major villages were, where possibly where major hunting grounds were. We have to, we have to remember that uh, British and French colonists have been interacting with native peoples since the, uh, the uh, 15th and 16th and 17th centuries. So they were trading with them. They were making war on them. They were trying in some ways to coexist with them. So they had a sense of where uh, native peoples were. Um, and so this, what you see here are, uh, is a representation of, of their understanding of, of the white settlers understanding of what could be described as uh, the chief villages for some of these people. But it also tells us a lot, right? As I was saying, it is also suggestive of the fact that they have had long-standing interactions with peoples in this region, primarily through trade, right? So we can think about these as, as representing trade routes we cannot see that aren't represented here, uh, but also, you know, unfortunately through warfare in the 18th century and before. Yeah, I think that's great. I mean, uh, Michael made a comment that this map was a key tool in helping us, um, and to quote his words, wallop the redcoats. Um, <laughs> And, but I think that this needs to be pointed out that it's not just the American Revolution. It's not the only squirmish uh, that is taking place. And so, yeah, it is those interactions, um, you know, at various levels between, you know, either the French and Indian War or, or with other Native American nations. Um, well, and the and warfare is, a, is an important point because when this, this map is created in 1755, this is around the time that what we call the French and Indian War or the Seven Years' War begins. And so this is one of the maps that people might have looked to to help figure out you know, how to plan campaigns, how to establish supply lines, things like that. Well, and um, Jim, speaking of maps used in war, um, uh, the second map we want to look at because, I mean, we're back for a mega teaching Tuesday. We're not just looking at one map or one primary source, right? No. I mean, we have a whole collection we're going through. Um, just kidding. We're only going to touch on like three or four. But yeah. the second map, <laughs> so, you know, the map that we just looked at, I think that's a great hidden story mm -hmm. is the, the warfare that that would have been used like people like Washington, maybe like Braddock um, within those situations, within in the wartime situation, using that. So not just to understand what's what's out west, but how to best protect it or defend it or take it from other people. Um, I mean, that's a very important dialogue in our history. Right. Um, but uh, another map was used um, for a war, um, but not by Americans um, within this collection, right? Yeah. I mean, let's, I wanna take a look at a map of New York that the British were using to attack us, you know, with their 32,000 ships uh, in New York Harbor. 
That's a Hamilton reference, Jim. I don't know if yeah. you picked up on that. Is That's there, a Hamilton. Is reference. there a musical out right now, or maybe on Disney Plus? That I, I, there's just some traffic on Twitter. I, I just don't know what's going on right now. It's, it's it's still it's a little still in the works. I don't know if it's gonna. I don't know if it's gonna make it big. Well, and as you're pulling this up, you know, one of the things mm -hmm. I'd like to point out is that many of the maps that you see in the Brown Collection are not quote unquote American made. You know, they are they are British made maps. They are made by British subjects, you know, even if they're in the colonies. Um, most of the really good maps come from Europe. They do not come from North America or what will become the United States. Um, okay, cool. That's All right. Like zooming this up. Yeah, I mean, I think that's so important to know. So, Jim, here it is. This is a delicious map. And I wish folks at home- I have never heard a map described as that. So I am all in about this map. It, it, is, it is delightful. And, I, and I'm sorry that folks at home cannot see it because on your screen, it appears to be a small map. This map is about seven, seven and a half feet tall, eight feet uh, and, and about five feet wide. It's huge. And Jim, just for reference, how tall are you? Let's not get into that. Okay, I guess it doesn't. That doesn't matter. It's it's a lot taller than me. Let's just put it that way. Um, now the map we saw before was a published map, and so what Evans, Lewis Evans, would have done is he would have drawn a manuscript map, and he would have sent it to London to be engraved. So somebody else would have taken that manuscript map, etched it onto a copper plate or another piece of material, and then, uh, like a printing press, it would have been printed. This is a manuscript map. And this map has been rarely seen by few individuals. Uh, in part, be, before Mr. Brown bought this map, it was hanging in a castle in Scotland. This uh, is a plan of New York Island and it's a, in part of Long Island. It was created in late 1776, early 1777. What you're seeing is all hand drawn and hand colored. Uh, done on papers. It's a manuscript map. And, and Jim, I just want to do a quick reminder because Jenna yeah. had that great question. All of these maps are through Mount Vernon that we're showing you now. So, so Richard Brown gave his collection, um, and and they are within uh, within Mount Vernon's collection, uh, Jenna. So, so this is a, a great way to access to it. Yeah, and and uh, what, what I should also point out is you can download this thing on your own if you want. Yeah, thirty two thousand troops. Uh, Christy, that's an excellent point. And we're going to talk about what you know the situation behind this map. So you can download this map and you can enjoy it on your own time and really zoom in. This map was created for a British general named Sir William Erskine by a, a man named Charles Blaskowitz. And what it narrates, and it really is telling a story, is it tells the story of the British invasion of New York beginning in the summer of 1776 through November when they recapture and, and take New York City and surrounding regions. Um, it is telling the story of the Continental Army and George Washington's catastrophic defeat over those summer months, a series of defeats really, in which they lose New York, one of the key cities and the key ports in North America during the American Revolution. This is a map of the Continental Army's failure and the Britain and British victory, uh, the British Army's victory. And I just, I still love, and as you're kind of thinking of the answer to this question, I still love that you are using this map is telling us a story, right? Mm -hmm. This map is telling us more than just where the the Hudson River flows or 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 where the the shorelines are. It's telling us a lot more deeper information that fits into such a large narrative. It really is. And, and to Kimberly's question, you know, how they've made the paper, they probably, I'd have to go back and look closely at the, at this map. Um, unfortunately, I haven't been to the library to see it in a long time because of COVID, but I, I would imagine, and I think you can probably see these are sheets of paper stitched together. Uh, I think I see some seams right there, uh, uh, right where your cursor is right there, Sadie. Um, yep. So it looks like we've got some got some sheets that are stuck together. Also, Jim, look at the quality of this zoom in. I mean, from far away, I didn't even realize. Like when we say it's telling a story, there are ships right here. Yes. 
I mean, there are there there's, there's, real details. there's a lot of amazing detail. And one of the and you know, we can explore this map for a little bit, but there there is at some place on the map, and I think it's in one of the corners, there's the legend Ooh. that tells you the information that's on the map. And what that legend does is it tells you essentially the order in which the British army and the Continental Army fought and some of the results of those battles and the major figures involved in those battles. And actually, Sadie, if you go, uh, I guess it's my, I... my left. Nope, sorry, my right. Right at the, the top of the Hudson River there. Okay. You see that There's... box with all that wonderful writing? This. Ex oh, the box that's entitled Explanation. Yeah. The explanation is key there because it's labeled. You can see A, B, C, D all the way down. You can go find various points on the map and you can essentially read how the, the British took New York. And importantly, they take New York and they hold it for the duration of the war. They do not lose it until they evacuate in 1783. So this is a seminal moment in the history of the American Revolution. And this map is capturing it. I'm just thinking of, I mean, thinking about our teachers out there. I mean, sitting like, what a great way to teach students about, I mean, as we, if we move this around, this, this says, um, this gives detail about the Battle of White Plains here. Um, uh, I'm trying to scroll down. We saw all these details, the explanations. Um, this talks about the plan for Brunswick. I mean, what a great visual to capture you know, the war with and, yeah. and, and a great story um, to really pull through an incredible primary source um, to talk about these great battles. Well, and I exactly. And I want to zoom in here in just a moment on the tip of Manhattan Island. But, you know, what I think uh, our folks at home might think about is why are certain areas of this map so exquisitely detailed and why are others not? Jim, I think that's a great, mm, do you think in our thinking routine, would we put this as a side or a hidden story? Hmm. Um, you know, that's interesting. I actually would call that a side story. Okay, great. Yeah. Great. So yeah. the, the main story of, of this map is, is, um, is the, is the, the progress of the campaign, which we see here. And then the focused on the detailed areas which show where a lot of these events are happening and what areas are important to the British. Mm -hmm. So maybe we can think about the side story about is about why areas are less detailed. Love it. Love it. And let's talk about that. Why are so many of these areas less detailed? Um, I'd love to see if anybody guesses, any teachers out there that we have, um, any ideas why some parts of these maps are more focused on than the others. They're typing. I can hear it. It's just ticking. <laughs> we live now in a world of five second delays. So we really do. Awkward silences no longer feel awkward or. Um, well, I love like the awkward sciences. I mean, being a teacher, like I love just sitting and staring at my students until somebody breaks, you know. Right. We can, we can sit here all day, Jim. We can just sit here and wait until people tell us why there is so much open area on yeah, this Why map. do you think? All right. Mm -hmm. Whoops. All right, we got some good guesses coming in. Yeah, yeah, we got some good guesses. Less settled farmland, identify key terrain, installations near water for naval use. That's a great observation. Remember, this is this is the 1770s. More settled versus unsettled, maybe. Less detailed because of not of strategic importance. I, I you know I think that gets us pretty pretty close to what we're looking at here. Now, we have to remember that this is a, a manuscript map. This is drawn. Uh, we think it was finished sometime in early 1777. So Charles Blaskowitz, the man who is making this map, would have been interested in the areas that were, were critical to this military campaign. 
um, and that he had time actually to go out and survey. And so, you know, he's focusing on the areas where the British army actually was at that point. Um, he's less interested in the spaces where they weren't. Uh, and so you can see a lot of the intense action is focused around lower Manhattan. You know, that's one of the places the British really need to take if they are going to try to defeat the rebellion. So at this moment, Blaskowitz, who is who is drawing this map, is less interested in the areas we see um, blank. And it's not just that we're not seeing settlements. We're not seeing any kind of terrain. Uh, we've got some roads here and there, but we're not seeing any sense of terrain, what the terrain looks like. So he may not have gone out that far to look because he probably didn't have to. He's really focusing on the areas around lower Manhattan. And then if we zoom in on lower Manhattan, we're going to see some amazing detail. Just right here, right? Yeah, just absolutely amazing. All remember, all hand drawn, all hand colored. That's incredible. I yeah. mean, yeah. yeah, you have ships on the side, ships crossing how they're coming into Kipps Bay. Um, all of these fine details. Yeah, yeah, it's so you see the urban space like right down there that's what new york city looked like in that period uh blaskowitz may have been drawing on previous maps from the 1760s that were made of new york to get the urban layout but then you know he's got a they're out there surveying and looking at the different spaces above lower manhattan you know this period it's all a lot of that the area north of the city is farmland still Very impressive. And I think that is, I think that is a great side story is that like, it's, it's bad. I mean, this is a battle map, right? I mean, wow. this is the strategic locations um, is the extreme important, uh, is the extremely important, this map. And, and as we think about our thinking routine, what are those hidden questions, right? The let's, let's dive into what is something that is missing um, from this map that that is important um, during these Revolutionary War battles or this terrain? Um, is there information that you wouldn't think is necessary at first, but then like after a really deep dive through it, um, what do you think would, would hit that kind of, you know, deepest caliber that we're searching for, Jim? That's a great question. And actually, I'd be curious to see what some other folks thought because I'm just watching the comments come in and the questions. And folks have some really great ideas about this map. And so, I mean, I'd be kind of curious to see what they think, you know, might be there, but not there. You know, what's what's sort of hidden? And is that That's something, great. do we need to think about maybe the larger context of what's going on at this particular moment uh, about, uh, you know, about this military campaign, which uh, I saw somebody was said it's a strategic setback. No, this was bad. I mean, this was a, this was a catastrophic defeat. For George Washington, this you know, this could have been the ball game pretty early on if the British Army had pressed their advantage, uh, but they don't for a lot of reasons we can talk about on another another live stream. Um, but yeah, well, and, and, I mean, because this is a fascinating topic because we actually did a teaching Tuesday. If we look back at our archives, um, where we looked at Winter Patriots, our our video series that we have kind of about. Um, the aftermath of this campaign, right, right, and how it's it's one of the lowest times. Um, it's and it's right before the the Battle of Trenton. Um, but we also followed this campaign not only through Winner's Patriot, our vi our video, but from Washington's World that interactive map where we kind of pinpointed and followed the various retreats of Washington through the Battle of Brook from White Pains, Brooklyn. Um, all the way down into the New Jersey campaign, um, which was able to um, really, you know, have a nice little change of, uh, you know, change well, of I, I, And actually, I think, Sadie, you get to what's sort of hidden with this map, because what, what we can, the story we can tell uh, from this map is that you know, this is told from a British perspective. This is their campaign to take New York and to hold it. Uh, in 1776 and 1777. But what we can also say then is that this map also narrates the, the defeats and the losses that forced George Washington to rethink his strategy. 
what you know what Washington wanted to be early in the war was a very aggressive commander. He wanted to fight like a normal European style battle and and put the Continental Army against the British Army and go head to head. What he realizes after this campaign is that the Continental Army cannot withstand a full-fledged assault by the British Army. And so he's going to shift to what he calls a war of posts. Uh, he's going to strike only when he thinks he can risk the army. So the Battle of Trenton is a really great example of that, of that strategy. Um, you know, the, and the you know, crossing of the Delaware, the attack on Trenton, the attack on Princeton, he is willing in that moment to risk the army because he thinks he has the advantage. And it's going to be, you know, not a pitched battle between two giant armies, but it's going to be a quick strike and a strategic site, uh, strike. And then part of this war post is also trying to take and hold key pieces of territory uh, that will be at the advantage of the Americans, but then also trying to frustrate British advance. And so to, to, to make their lives difficult so that they cannot simply crush the rebellion in one swift blow. So this map narrates the British victory. It's a great British triumph, but it also, the hidden story behind it, I think, is, is how it compelled Washington to rethink how the Americans, or at least the Continental Army, because we have to remember, not all Americans are, are on board with this independence thing. Right, right. But how, how the Continental Army is going to try to shift its focus and to try to at least survive uh, and, and to wear the British down so that the British get tired of fighting. I just, I, I'm going to like immediately just pull up Anne's comment to absolutely connect with that and, and great insight on how he learned to defeat and change the strategy. And I love that we can pull that, we can get a visual sense of how he, you know, see his train of thought based on these maps, mm -hmm. um, you know, really get that connection to, um, what it was like to traverse those terrains or what it was like to lose, as you said, New York. I mean, to never have it again for the rest of the war until, you know, the British left is a big, you know, that's a big weight to carry um, throughout those those positions. Um, and I am glad, you know, we did tie it back to George Washington, um, you know, <laughs> in case, you know, the big boss. Um, but because since the last map, I'm just looking at our time because sometimes Teaching Tuesday yeah. time slips away from us um, because we just get too excited. Um, I want to bring up a map that he actually surveyed um, of one of his farms because it is, uh, mm -hmm. well, it is the anniversary of his, his uh, surveying position. Um, and and I'd love, so, you know, we've, we, I love how, you know, that first map makes a connection to the French and Indian War. The second one is a great connection to the Revolutionary War. Um, this other map I want to show, you know, is Washington's, you know, connects to his his farming ventures, um, his status as the plantation owner, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, but still shares, uh, I guess I can stop sharing this, those, <laughs> those same um, surveying skills. Okay, so we're going to pull this up. And as we look at this, um, Teaching Tuesday, friends, um, Jim and I just kind of, you know, long verbally um, broke down through the other maps that critical thinking routine of the, you know, the main, the side, the hidden. Um, we're going to start putting it on you guys uh, now. We are going to start, uh, we're going gonna to flip this right back at you guys. Um, just to let you know, here I can, um, what we are looking at. We are looking at a partial survey of Ferry Plantation with two crop rotation tables, 1787. I'm only showing this. I know it's probably giving some stuff away, but we're still doing that object analysis where we're just, we're step one, observe. We're, we're looking at the title to understand it. Um, but so take a look at this. This is a map. Mm -hmm. uh, as Cynthia said, it's really cool that Washington made it. Um, so look it over because as we are understanding this, let's pull out that main story. You know, tell us in the chat, what is that main central story being depicted here? What is that, that just first basic level, 
of information, the what that's here. Fill us in, you tell us. Jim, I want to play the Jeopardy theme song. Can you start singing it for us, please? <laughs> Nobody wants to hear my singing. <laughs> I, uh, I think I was last in choir in the eighth grade, and I think that was enough for, for most people's ears. But, you know, it, it is uh, interesting to think about this map. And, you know, one of the things we can also think about is uh, both what's on it, but then also, you know, its physical condition. Uh, and the way that it is is uh, made, you know, does that tell us something about how it was used? Yeah, and so we're starting to get some answers here. So um, Cynthia, you know, uh, mentioned that it's indicating which fields to plant. Um, you know, Ron is saying that at the very most, it, it's it's the farm layout. It's it's the layout of this one piece uh, of the larger farm. All good. Yeah, I like you know trying to quantify assets for a better output or future farm layout. Let's see, property lines, uh, fields to plant, all good observations, certainly. Whoops, I clicked the wrong one. Oh, there, yeah. Rolling through here. Yeah. I am too. Crop yields, um, great. I mean, so yeah, so this, I mean, that's absolutely what the point of this map is. It, it uh -huh. shows, um, it shows the different crops to be planted uh, in the different fields. It breaks down. I mean, if we can even zoom in just like we can, it breaks down the acreage of each different little section of the farm. As we can see here, it does have those property lines. Um, more coming in. I'm, I'm, uh, I think, and now as so, it's a great layout of Fairy Farm. Um, and now if we switch to, all right, what's happening on the side? What What's a side story that's coming down from just looking at this? What are what are some some questions that we, that students can ask about a side story or, or side stories that we're picking up uh, ourselves here? Um, what's that next kind of on the peripheral information we can pick from here? This is a fun exercise. I like this a lot. Yeah. Good. Well, and I happen to find that apparently all of the primary source analysis uh, thinking routines that we do, everything just comes in three, right? We we do our our observes, our our uh, the the first one the the first uh, analysis steps that we did. We did our our observer, our deeper reading. Um, and then on then our larger broad questions, this we have our main main side hidden stories. Um, I mean, it's just everything is, is a nice three. I think that's an easy chunk mm -hmm. to remember for these. We got yes. Yeah, so what crops were typical through the year? Seasonal planting. Very good. That's a great yeah additional information to pull. Without the Weather Channel, that's I mean that's a great point. I mean these are collections of historical data, um, pinpointing measurements. Oops, I clicked on the wrong one. That was not. I mean yes, think, sink, one, think, see, wonder. That's one of our great thinking routines. Um, but Michael, this is the one I meant to click on to pull up some of these side stories. Yeah, good. Uh, a good thought there, I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah, crop yields, sort of thinking about what you would need to either buy or what seed you would need to harvest from the prior and year. This, yeah, and Susie's touching in on that same mm -hmm. thing. So this is really talking to us, yeah, about the economics that it comes with farming. Um, you know, crop yields, earnings, expenses, right, to, and then the different types of seeds to be able to purchase. Um, and as we near the end of this, let's put in that big last question. Oh, yes. Um, 
Yeah, fill us in. So what's not being told? What is the hidden story that this map is talking with us about? Things that, you know, are not full. I mean, it's a deep dive below the surface, you know, information that's presented or information that's missing. What is that important, valuable information that's still going to teach us a lesson? Also, Jim, congratulations. This is a world record for a Teaching Tuesday. I don't know if we've ever crossed the hour threshold. And to do it with such engagement, um, it must be because the voice and face of Mount Vernon is joining us. <laughs> I doubt that. I think it's more the material, and I think that people have, have brought good ideas and questions to the session. So I'm just here to wear the shirt on a live stream for once, and then... And you look good doing it. <laughs> Thank you. You look good doing it. Oh, okay. So as people are like, keep thinking about that hidden story. But I love Cynthia's comment of connecting this document, these maps to other sources. Because again, one of the things that we really talk about with our primary sources is they're incredible to learn from. They help us with our thinking routine. They make us, you know, emotionally connect with the past, but they're just little puzzle pieces. Um, and they fit better with wider narratives of extra documentation, more objects to push through and showcase. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, this is a great, this would be a great piece um, to accompany with farm books or records um, or uh, documentation um, as Tim is saying about human resources uh. needed. Um, I think this is a really important um, hidden story is, is as we zoom in on this map and we look at, um, you know, number five here, this is 60 acres. Um, this is 60 acres over here. We can see, you know, he really, Washington really lays out the amount of acres. I mean, this is a very big farm, 60 acres right here. You know, that's 60 soccer fields. Um, and then you have all these different sections and the different material to grow. Um, but what is the manpower, correct? I mean, what is the manpower that takes to farm that area? And and particularly important, who's doing that labor? Right. All right, Tim, you're, you're spot on there with human resources needed. That's one of the big side stories. So now we ought to think about who's actually doing that labor, right? Who Who is planting these 60 acres and tending them? Who are those individuals specifically left off this document? Oh, that's a good point, Susie. Yeah. Yeah. It's coming, Jim. And since we're at a time, maybe we should just have you, Ant. Let's talk well, about it's, yeah, I think. So. As we, yeah, we're 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 talking about, and Jenna's got it right here. Um, this is a this is a map uh, that shows hidden slavery. Uh, this is a map that would uh, this would uh, this is about crop yields, crop rotations, but the people who are doing this work are enslaved laborers, and so we we're not seeing them here, but we can you know as putting this document in conversation with other things, as you said, Sadie, with other resources. We know that enslaved laborers are, are doing this work. We know that they are the primary agricultural producers here. And Washington's riding around on his horse every day, checking his fields, and planning planting all these crops, rotations, and whatnot, and and keep capturing this data on yields. But the people who are doing it are the people who are enslaved at Mount Vernon. So that's really a, a really powerful way to look at a map that you think might simply be a collection of geographic and economic data, but then think about the human story behind that, who's doing that work. And that's a really, I think, a really good way to introduce students as well, you know, to this question of who does this kind of labor at a, play, at a place like Mount Vernon or Monticello, Montpelier, or any other plantation or farm in 18th century Virginia. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that that is, a. I mean, um, the individuals are not listed here by name, but we find out so much about the level of work that was required, the skills that 
um, are required of their knowledge to understand boundary lines and different um, types of farming techniques that were required, um, you know, mm -hmm. to understand the different types of produce. Um, you know, we think of skilled labor as blacksmith and carpenters, um, but this is skilled uh, and hard labor as well. And I think that those are absolutely important stories um, that we're pulling out, that, that these individuals are not listed here, but their presence um, and the information we can learn about them is still super valuable in maps like these. I totally agree. Michael says, why are we limited to one hour? We're having fun here. I completely agree, but I'm, Thanks, actually, like, I'm actually like five minutes late for a meeting, but you know what? Let's just keep going. So I don't have to. <laughs> I, I mean, I want to, I want to, and I missed everybody and I missed these teaching discussions and, and these great thinking routines and hearing about your input of how you use primary sources in the classroom and the skills that teachers bring and that the history buffs bring to help us share these resources and the valuable insights that you guys bring. So thank you so much for tuning in to our our mapping Monday with the Teaching Tuesday crew. Jim, is that what we, I think that's what we decided to call it. It's a very long business card, but yeah. It's, it's a that. super long business card just to match our super <laughs> long programming. Um, I don't have a date. Please look for our next Teaching Tuesday. I promise there's gonna be one in August. Thank you all teachers. You are the heroes of our society. Our thoughts are with you all as, as, as you know, plans are being made for the fall. As always, we are here. Um, uh, we are here to support you and we, we love being a part of your classrooms and your curriculum. Um, I mean, Jim wore his best shirt because he was so excited to see you all. Um, so uh, keep us, uh, keep talking with us, keep staying with us. Have a great rest of the summer. We're gonna see you in August. Um, and thank you for tuning in for the longest Teaching Tuesday on a Monday um, that's ever happened. Um, I'll, I'm gonna click, I, my goodbyes take 10 minutes, yep. but I think this is time. Okay, thank you all.